Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramph, and I'm here to tell you about all the things that are happening in the city of Missoula and beyond. I got Heidi West here with the uh, the North Missoula Community Development Corporation talking about a land trust. I also got Ro Aaron with uh, the Guts Program. Uh, going to be talking about that uh, girls using their strength later on in the show. But first and foremost, let's kick things off with a little bit of weather. It is currently 29 degrees outside. Your high is going to be 34, your low is going to be 25. A lot of that uh, snow that's been falling this week is going to get a lot colder, so expect some of that snow to possibly turn into sheetrock. But I've noticed that a lot of, uh, um, later in the day, a lot of the snow has, that has been falling, uh, there's been a lot of uh, wetness, so you have that rain coming in through Sunday, Sunday night. But that's not the biggest story, because one of the bigger stories is what's happening in Billings, Montana. In Billings, Montana, uh, got uh, snow and boy or girl, uh, are they expecting another foot of snow in the next week or so? The city is now at 28.5 inches of snowfall on the season, putting it two inches above the average, according to the National Weather Service in Billings. 6.5 inches just earlier this week, and now uh, the um, National Weather Service issued a wind chill advisory uh, winter uh, Wednesday morning for Fallon and Carter County due to the potential for wind chill temperatures as low as minus 25 degrees. Wednesday was crazy with a day of snow stall, uh, snowfall starting at 11 a.m. with an inch an hour until about 4 p.m. Billings is expected to get even more snowball uh, snowfall by Sunday. And if you are interested in some of the snow, if you go to onthesnow.com, you can get a nice representation of some of the snowfall that's been happening in the um, Montana area. Of course, if you look at Whitefish Mountain Ski Resort, you can see 10 inches in the last 72 hours, but it looks like there hasn't been any fresh powder in the last 24 hours, but you can expect many much much snow has ha fallen on these snow slopes so maybe this weekend will be the perfect weekend since it can be fairly clear uh, for some winter activities so um, once again you can go to nationalweatherservice.org or you can go to onthesnow.com for more information about your snowfall let's talk about some news that are happening uh, but of course this has been going on for many years now um, no questions asked um, there are groups that help teens and troubled youth that are not governed uh, that the government recognized uh, that are not recognized uh, and they are represented as a religious group. Uh, that means um, a lot of times, so this is, has to do with the uh, the Christian Children's Ranch near San Ignatius. Um, the, um, so uh, Pine Haven Christian Children's Ranch near St. Ignatius in the last 10 years, law enforce enforcement reports notes 11 runaways, seven reports of abuse, and one suicidal teen. None of the abuse report was submitted by law enforcement investigators. Um, a former Pinewood staff uh, member who requested anonymity told the Missoulian he believes that the facility should be under state oversight, not because of its treatment of children, but because of what he called unsanitary ranching facilities and practices. Every legislative sessage, uh, session since 2007, uh, the Board of Private Alternative Adolescence R Residential and Outdoor Programs, which is PAA, RP was given licensing power and programs affiliated with churches were exempt from oversight. Health professionals and lawmakers have fought to close this loophole, but every time this is up in the sessions, groups that are represented by uh, um, religious groups that represent these uh, programs come in force and it usually gets voted off and it would infringe on their religious freedoms. In state news, uh, actually in national news, uh, the Senate bill to reopen the government failed. Uh, but at this time, most bills uh, tend to be dead on arrival unless both sides to agree to open the government. The votes came on day 34 of the partial government shutdown, which was on Wednesday, so 36 days about, which has left some 800,000 federal employees with their second, without their second straight paycheck, which uh, many would have received Friday in absence of the shutdown. Uh, the two proposals were uh, to have provided for two weeks of operating money for the government, uh, but no funds for the wall. Uh, they, they needed 60 votes. They only had 52. Um, and then the second one, um, let's see here, was um, one all about the wall and amnesty to existing immigrants. That was the, one of the proposals, but both, of course, uh, failed. Um, the Department of Homeland Security um, wrote a letter to the government about the shutdown, and they said, DHS employees who protect the traveling public, investigate in counterterrorism, and protect critical infrastructure should not have to rely on the charitable generosity 
of others for assistance in feeding their families and paying their bills while steadfastly focusing on the mission at hand. For many federally funded organizations uh, are digging into previously funds where they, uh, where they can uh, fund many of the organizations like the USDA is a prime example, uh, say that they'll run out of resources by early February. Uh, so there's just kind of like the, some of the deadlines that the government has to do to reopen the government and start paying some of the workers. So those are some of the things that are happening in the news. I have a couple guests. I don't want to keep them waiting too long. So here is an art clip uh, from the Zach. And then when I come back, I'll have Heidi West. Hi, everybody. We're back here with Heidi West, and you're here to talk about um, a land trust that's happening. So where's this land trust? Yeah, so we, um, I work for the North Missoula Community Development Corporation. We have a community land trust um, that currently has 47 units in it, and we're expanding. So we have seven more units that are coming online, um, and we're looking for applicants. Cool. Um, so these, uh, this development is called Lee Gordon Place. Um, it's on French Street, so um, right across from the new library. There's a lot of activity happening on French Street these days. Um, and there are seven homes. Um, there's one two-bedroom accessible unit, uh, four two-bedroom, two-bath units, um, and then two four-bedroom units. Uh, and what makes these unique is that uh, they're set aside for folks that make 80% area median income or below. Which um, is... Um... So for a family, I wrote down my numbers, so for a family of one, a household of one, that would be um, 39450 And then for a household of four, so it adjusts as you add yeah, people, that number moves up. Um, so four people, that would be 56300 um, So that's... That's what a lot of people make in Missoula. Those are really um, reasonable, or maybe not reasonable wages, but wages that people are you know, earning. So maybe if you're a teacher or working in the healthcare industry or the service industry, this, this, this could be you. Um, and so we're accepting applications to be accepted into our community land trust program. Um, those, that deadline is February 1st. And then we'll have a raffle of eligible home buyers, um, and they'll get first choice. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to equalize the playing field because sometimes, you know, we didn't want there to be any like personal, um, you know, maybe we would know an applicant. We didn't want to give anyone an unfair advantage. Right. And and well, like, how can people apply? Like, what is the? So the easiest thing would be to go to our website, which is just nmcdc.org, um, and there's a link to applications. Um, also, some handbooks, some information about the community land trust model. Um, what the restrictions are, what it means for people, how it's different from renting or also owning in a market rate house, so it's a little bit different. Um, what's really important is that, um, so our average house price right now is about 300000 and that's really, oh, yeah. <laughs> really yeah. unattainable to as most a, folks. Uh, as a new homeowner myself. <laughs> Um, nice. um, it's, Congratulations. It, yeah, thank you. But it's, uh, it's, it is very interesting to really think about, um, you know, where you're going to live 
Yeah. I mean, because it's always like when you're when you're at a, when you're basically the safety net that you've always depended on yeah. fails you. It's like you you know like he's like I just made enough money to pay the rent, but it's like you also need first and last month right? to help get you into yeah. it. But let's talk about some of the uh, programs that um, what other programs are working with you to help make so this a possibility. So there is so in order so the price that we're bringing them to the market at is. Ranges from 135 to 175,000 for the four bedrooms, and that's there's a big difference between market rate right now and what these homes cost. And so we've done this with a lot of help from a lot of people. Um, so the city uh, of Missoula, we have a CDBG and a home grant. Um, the Missoula Redevelopment Agency also put some funding into this project. Um, the uh, Brownfields grant to deal with original like the site the original site and some environmental cleanup that had to happen. Um, and then also the Department of Commerce, we have a um, home grant from them. So it's taken a lot of people um, to get us to this place, to being able to bring these to the market. Um, and what's really unique about the community land trust model is that th these homes are subsidized at the beginning and one time. So each unit has about $140,000 of subsidy, which is a lot of subsidy. But um, over these are permanently affordable. Right. And I'm assuming is this uh, are these houses to buy? They are to buy. Oh and wow! So somebody um, buys them, um, and then they own the home, and then they rent the land from us right. at a really low cost. So it's similar to having maybe a lease on Forest Service land. Most Montanans know that situation. Um, and then when we go, when the homeowner goes to resell, there's a resell formula um, that sets the price that they can sell it at. Mm. And that keeps it affordable for the next family. And so, for example, right now, our community land trust has been going since 2002. We have 43 homes that are in the program, and um, they've served over 99 families. Wow. And so it gives people an opportunity to either buy their forever home or transition from renting right. to home ownership, and then maybe they get a better job and they can have a stable cost of living and so they can save money and then eventually buy a Margaret right. house. So um, we see all sorts of scenarios. Um, but a lot of our people do go on to own market rate houses in the Missoula area, or they get a job you know, somewhere else and they move right. out of state. But um, it really um, makes your cost of housing predictable yeah. um, over the long term. And that's, a, you know, when housing prices and rents are going up cool. and up so and up, it's if you, awesome. So um, here's a question I kind of want to, like, this is very broad, but this is a very, like, a question to really think about for those of you at home. Um, but um, God, I'm starting to lose it because I'm, I'm, I'm by, biding time to try to rethink really about <laughs> the question I just forgot about. Um, but what do you think the importance of this program is? You know, um, the importance is uh, basically if, if you look at the Missoula housing market, we don't have homes that are kind of on the lower end. And so we really feel, <laughs> sorry. No, it's not. Like, uh, so we really, uh, we fill a, a missing gap. Um, that, that exists in our housing market in Missoula. Right. And it gives people the opportunity uh, to, you know, purchase a home that they probably wouldn't be able to purchase on the, the open market, and it allows them to gain equity. They do gain um, their own equity, even though it's capped. It's not, right. you know, you're not going to get 8% per year, you know, as the housing market is inflating. Um, and then um, it... It keeps that cost. Your cost of housing is predictable um, because your mortgage payment isn't going to vary as much. Yeah. As because a lot of times, high, uh, so. once you lock into a mortgage, it never changes. Yeah. It's just very constant. Yeah, it's constant, and then you know your property taxes might shift a little bit from year to year, um, but it's a lot more predictable yeah. than being a renter, um, especially in this you know market where they, we have a really low rate of vacancies. Yeah. So um, I, I definitely like to think of this as like it's a step up. But it's also a smart step up to yeah. really think about um, where you're going to be in the future. Mm -hmm. And like, if you're not too confident um, financially, you can apply and see if you get it. Yeah, and um, we do ask folks to, you know, go take a home ownership class with Homeward and talk yes. to a financial housing counselor. And so people make really informed decisions, um, and hopefully. You know, that oh, yeah, I mean, help like, them out in the long term. Homeward so. can help me, <laughs> yeah, it can help you, <laughs> yeah. So. Like, Homeward's great. Like, honestly, I can yeah. say enough about um, 
uh, Brendan and all those guys over at Homeward. Yeah, they're awesome. So we work closely with them and making sure we have educated home buyers and um, yeah, hopefully we'll get some applicants. And awesome. So once again, before we go, where can people apply? Yep. So um, the easiest thing is to go to our website at nmcdc.org. There's links to an application, a home buyer um, information booklet. Um, you're always welcome to call our office. Um, and yeah, I look forward to hearing from people. So awesome. thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, we'll be right back. We got another guest on for you guys. So it's a, it's a full show. We'll be right back right after this. Guys, we're back here with Ro Aaron, and she is the Guts Program Manager with the YWCA. So tell people at home, what is Guts? Yeah, good question. Guts is Girls Using Their Strengths, and we're a youth um, empowerment and leadership program for girls and um, also gender diverse youth ages 9 to 18. And we do, um, during the school year, we do school-based programs after school and during lunch. Um, we have trade exploration workshops and summer outdoor adventure trips. Cool. And you also, like, uh, I saw online that you had an orientation, which is, yeah. it's already happened, but you're always looking for volunteers to, like, be woman leaders uh, of the future, right? Yes. Yeah, and we're actually looking, still looking for a few more volunteers, so if people are interested, um, definitely get a hold of us. Um, and basically the volunteer role is um, we recruit um, people to mentor young people in the schools. So the semester um, usually happens, there's 11 weeks in the fall and 11 weeks in the spring, and it's a once a week commitment after school um, or during lunch. Cool. And it's really fun to get to work with a small group and do fun, kind of like discovering your strengths and talking about leadership skills and um, issues that young people face. Yeah, and what are, the, what, what, is the, what are one of the more common issues that you hear from the youth? Um, I would say, I mean, relationships, uh, you know, adolescence is really tough. They're trying to figure out, um, you know, friendship dynamics yeah. and I think bullying and um, just the ins and outs of friendships is probably one of our biggest. But I would say especially for people raised as girls in our society, um, body image and self-esteem is also one that we see quite often and one that we um, want to address and just yeah. normalize for them. Yeah. I mean, like, one of the things I definitely noticed, like, I do a couple after-school programs, mm -hmm. and it's so weird because it's like you see, like, some kids are just like, I don't want to work with that kid because I hate them. And it's like, okay. And a lot of times it's like they're, a lot of them are fairly forward when it comes to yeah. how they feel about each other. And like, at that age, it's like ambition. They're just like, they're not afraid from, yeah. of anything. So it's a lot easier to kind of understand where they're coming from. But a lot of times, I think the one thing that I always notice about kids is that they're usually kind of ignored. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, they, they, because they talk a lot and really, really fast. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of really hard to pick up on a lot of things here and there. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and I think they're still trying to figure things out. It's their first time, like, really, you know, understanding and kind of exploring social hierarchy and power. And there's not a lot of support for them in terms of people who know 
have experience with right. this. And um, through this experience, um, you're, you're kind of looking for people who kind of exemplify um, kind of like leadership roles in the community, right? Yeah, and that could look like, you know, somewhat like the sort of traditional leadership. It could look like um, even just being really passionate about something in your life and um, interest or leadership doesn't have to be someone who's really extroverted and like excited to talk. It can be someone who's more quiet and um, we want to encourage that that looks like leadership too. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, where can people find more information about this? Um, you can find out more information about this and also just the GUTS program and the YWCA at our website, ywcaofmissoula.org. And I also want to give a shout out. We're doing, through the GRIT program, which is our skilled trades workshops, we're doing a one-day um, kind of exploratory trades workshop at Missoula College that's actually open to um, all ages, 14 and up. And it's for women and um, non-binary, gender diverse folks who are interested in the trade. So people who have traditionally been left out of that um, you know, left out or not encouraged to um, seek these skills. Um, so that's coming up February 8th, and it's going to be all day. You can find out more information on our website. Cool. And I also know that uh, YWC does a lot of uh, programs for a lot of families here mm -hmm. in town as well. A lot of great things happening on that end. And I know that YWC also does a, um, a talk. Like, do they monthly talks? Are they going to be starting out that, that pretty soon? Um, we're actually doing book clubs. Oh, cool. So it's, talks kind of turn into book clubs. I know there's one coming up. We're reading Michelle Obama's book, Becoming, in February. So oh. check that out on our Facebook. Yeah, Michelle Obama is yeah. definitely, like, on point when it comes to, you know, using her strengths. Totally. Yeah, it's like, I'm the first lady, but... I'm nobody's first lady. I'm my own person, right. which is really cool. That's what I love about Michelle Obama. I can yeah. talk about it forever. But anyways, um, <laughs> what is the uh, like? W w what is a good thing to leave on for like like volunteers? Just something to think about. Like maybe like an anecdotal story from volunteering. Um, let's see. I think volunteering. I can't think of a, a story offhand, but um, a success we've had in our recent one of our recent programs is. Um, you know, we put a lot of work into this program and we were struggling with getting um, participants there. But once we got people there and they had their second, um, this was through the GRIP program, they had their second workshop. Um, they were like, we want to hang out all the time. This is like, this is the best, so one of the participants said, this was the best weekend I've had in like so long. So just, I mean, I think that it can be um, an opportunity where you can kind of hear the effects that you're having. And so it can be really rewarding to work with yep. um, the young people. Nice. Probably as you know. So. Right. Of course. Yeah. yeah. I would. Yeah, definitely. I would know. Yes. Me. I know. <laughs> All right. Cool. So um, once again, um, I, I got in contact with the YWCA by just going on their website, ywcaofmissoula.org. And yeah, if you just inquire about, like, just contact them and be like, hey, I, I want to be part of YWCA in some form, you can be part of them because there's so many different opportunities to volunteer with them especially with Guts, which just had their orientation recently, but it's never too late to look for volunteers, right? Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Scott. Anything else you want to say, or are we good? I think we're good. Awesome. All right, guys, uh, we'll be right back. We have um, some new programs for you guys on MCAT, so stay with us. I got more show. Cool. Um, curious about how Trump was handling it behind the scenes because we know that he got upset that Brett Kavanaugh when he went on Fox was so subdued um, and wasn't you know fighting and nasty and the White House sent Kavanaugh word that if he wanted to save himself he would have to do that but the part I was curious about was you know Trump's brother died of alcoholism at 42 and he always told his kids don't drink and um, you know Trump himself only has one addiction it's a bad one unfortunately but he doesn't drink he doesn't gamble he doesn't 
do substances. He, he is addicted to attention. Uh, the number of delinquency cases really peaked in the mid to uh, late 1990s, about 1996, 1997, that pointer right there. And since that time, uh, for approximately the last 20 years or so, uh, total delinquency cases in juvenile courts in the United States have declined. And you'll notice that since 2008 through 2014, which was the end of this uh, reporting period, a pretty steep decline in those cases. Kind of brings you to one of the really important topics of being a self-published author is writing in series and writing fast. Um, so the one important thing is to know about in this topic, this discussion, not going to get into should you traditionally publish, should you self-publish, it is truly a self-publishing talk. Um, that discussion you can read about online uh, for days. So I'm not going to spend the hour on that discussion today. Um, but writing in series is very, very important for self-publishing um, because you get your readers interested in your series and then they want to buy the next book and then the next book and then the next book and that keeps going. What's very important though is that you know the norms of your genre and follow them. Well, tis the season for another reboot um, mesh-up that is movies. It's time for Pre-Critic. So kicking things off for the beginning of your movie week is uh, the kid who will be king, who would be king, shoulda, woulda, coulda. But this UK is, uh, the United Kingdom is really trying to ex uh, export those young British kids is actually special and with a little help from their friends of uh, uh, can save the day. Um, the movie. Uh, basically, this is a sum of its parts type movie where uh, we uh, follow a loser kid uh, as he discovers he's the next King Arthur. <laughs> um, watch as we uh, take a modern spin on the British lore from humble beginnings with a modern twist. Um, that always works out okay. All right, next up. Nope. It ain't the sci-fi movie uh, that everyone wants back because no, nobody cares about Serenity. Starring um, people in this drama about finding balance in life, Anne Hathaway and Matthew McConaughey uh, star in this drama about a sea captain and his ex-wife bringing him into a world of hurt. Um, the past comes back to haunt you in this one. But th I think uh, people will come out of this being like, no wonder this came out late January when nobody cares in January. Like, these are the kind of movies, there's a lot of movies that are going to be coming out late January, February, they're just kind of like, uh, these are originally going to be Oscar movies, but they kind of like, yeah, that's not going to happen, so we're just going to kind of throw them into January where it gets forgotten, because let's face it, January is one of those months that people just want to forget before it even starts. All right, so there's that, pre that concludes Pre-Critic. There's a bunch of crappy movies coming out this weekend. All follow the same tropes of a person going into a mysterious world, learning to adapt and survive. That's pretty much every movie everywhere. Um, it's, Wiz it's Wizard of Oz, people. And Wizard of Oz is basically 80 now, which is really surprising. Think about it. Wizard of Oz just turned 80. All right, um, let's talk about some um, a movie. Um, it's Flagship Friday. Here is a uh, video that was made uh, by a bunch of those wacky kids at CS Porter. And basically, it's a first-person uh, horror video game movie thing. Yeah, I, uh, you'll, you'll see. I, here's a little taste of that. And when I come back, I'm going to talk about some city council. They're talking about some public works and about how much is it going to cost to replace our broken water pipe system. More on that after this. Hello, this is CSPN, CS Porter Nightmares. This is a survival game. This is an abandoned school, as you can see. Find clues. That is remnants from abandoned school. You must find clues. Find 
Find clues? This is a new game. You play Beethoven. CSPN. C is Porter Nightmares. This is abandoned school. Wait, where are you going? I haven't finished what I was saying. Congratulations, you died. That is an example of people you should not talk to. You never let me finish. Water bottle. Weapon. You found a water fountain. from now on since he died more than once. You've died too many times. Woof. And you've annoyed both my dog and my cat. <coughs> Minions. Okay. How much you want to bet that? The exit. Show them the exit. Is that right? So leave with crap. Get out of here. I'm bored. Freedom. <laughs> if you like uh, Wake Up Missoula on our, on our YouTube channel, you'll be able to watch the whole entire video without any kind of speed up interruptions. All right, let's talk about some MCAT stuff before I jump into city council. If you are interested in being a part of the MCAT, you can come on down every Wednesday for our orientation happening at 5.30. I am looking at the wrong camera at 5.30 <laughs> every Wednesday. Um, MCAT.org. Um, you can alert. You can contact us. You can go to how do I uh, request um, event recording, submit a program, which means, hey, you saw some of those programs that I just showed you earlier in the show. You want to be, uh, you want MCAT to shoot things for you. Um, you got, you can contract us to uh, totally shoot things for you. All right. So that's kind of like what that's all about. Um, for more information. Once again, go to Wake Up Missoula. Um, you can go to wakeupmissoula.wixsite.com slash wakeupmissoula. It's so nice. We made you write it out twice. But also, if you Google Wake Up Missoula, you can find all sorts of fun content, uh, which includes uh, past Wake Up Missoula episodes and past interviews uh, like the ones you're going to see today, along with Dublin stuff like Ship Friday and a little bit of tasting of – dude, I just drew – I don't even know I w used that word tasting, but – Without further ado, let's just kick things off with some city council. If you are an interested person, interested in city council and the city government and the city of Missoula in general, um, or just want to learn about the city of Missoula and how it works, you can go to ci.missoula.mt.us. Um, all this content I'm going to be talking about and show you is courtesy of the city of Missoula. And of course, MCAT. All right, let's kick things off with what's going on with MCAT. Public Works. It's all about those pipes in Missoula, but what's the plan to replace all the pipes? So basically, they come up with a plan. It's pretty simple. The committee meeting is looking for an annual assessment of replacing water infrastructure in the Missoula area, particularly replacing water pipes, um, not necessarily water mains because that could slow things down. Um, water engineer... Uh, 
Logan McInnes uh, brings a presentation for the city and staff and what I'll be talking about today. First things first, the water pipes in Missoula are old um, and leaking. Um, a good percentage of the water that uh, gets pumped goes right back into the aquifer, uh, but not enough to cause leaks. Uh, a lot of the soil in uh, Missoula is so clay and muddy that a lot of the water that uh, would be uh, seeping through from the leak just automatically goes down to the aquifer, which also means our aquifer is technically unprotected by any kind of environmental hazardous material that could seep into the aquifer. Just, you know, just thinking of, thinking out loud. But um, here is Shannon Adams. Shannon Adams is uh, with HDR Engineering, and she's uh, there to talk a little bit about the water uh, main replacement and how much that may cost. We've recommended the city have a goal of a 1% replacement rate for water mains. Um, it's, it's pretty kind of simple math. So there's about 337 miles of water main in the system. If you replace 1%, that's 3.37 miles of water main, and that gets you about a 100-year replacement cycle. So that's the goal. I mean, water mains are supposed to last about 100 years. We're kind of behind you know, on the water main replacements. Um, so the goal is to ramp up to that 1% sometime between five and 10 years from now. All right, so um, many of the speculation that people are wondering is like, are they gonna raise the rates on um, water? Um, Yes, but not to a point where it's going to replace all the water mains. It's not like a huge infrastructure replacement main kind of deal. It's going to be taking time to slowly replace a lot of water mains to have an effective thing. And it's going to, it's going to take time. And uh, it's going to basically for each mile, um, it, it, it's basically $1.5 million per one mile of pipe. And that includes um, digging up the ground, putting down the pipe, the cost of the pipe, and then also um, uh, fixing the road once the pipe's inserted. And that basically covers all those costs. Um, a Mo a Logan McInnes, uh, the engineer with uh, Missoula Water, and he was also with the Montana uh, Mountain Water Company before the, acqui before the acquisition. And... Um, Hold on one second. And this is what he had to say about water main replacement. Last year, we, we did a lot of work on service lines, which is great. I mean, we, we know that a lot of the leakage happens on service lines. But it also, you know, it can add probably a, maybe 30% or something to the cost of replacing mains. So it's, it's a bit of an internal struggle. Do we want to continue replacing service lines that we don't own? Or do we want to come up with other mechanisms? You know, it's the customer's responsibility. We're working on, on some other programs that I think, you know, we'll be here and not long with the, the warranty program and also a loan program. And so we're, we're identifying other tools to help the customers. All right. So um, what he was kind of referring to is a lot of the pipes, especially the ones that are directly under people's properties, aren't owned by um, the uh, Missoula Water Company, formerly Mountain Water Company, but it's owned by the property owner that could work out a deal with the Missoula Water Company for a loan for the water, pay, uh, for the water pipe, which would uh, be initialized with their um, system to help pay off a new water main pipe because the people who own the property also own the water main. The service lines is, are the lines that the city owns. So it's very interesting how they want to replace the mains um, without uh, running into um, digging into your property without your permission. So that's it's, it's complicated on that regard, um, but they kind of go into it a little bit more. Um, Oops, I totally deleted the wrong video. My bad. I got to go find it again. All right. So anyways, I just wanted to uh, get back into it. Ah, oh, geez. I just kind of shot myself in the foot on this one. Um, just, just bear with me a second. I need to find the right placement of this video. And this is more about um, Logan talking about some of the old piping and some of the things that they kind of run into in terms of, of what the pipes are necessarily made of. Um, so this is what he had to say. Um, here he is. I think, you know, wait, hold on. Sorry. This is going to take a little bit of time as I accidentally deleted it, but he here it is coming up. So here is Logan McInnes talking about, uh, the current structure of the water system. It's amazing. Very rarely you'll find, like we found a record the other day, we thought, oh, here's one that says it's a lead gooseneck, which is just 
kind of the connection right at the main, a foot or two at the main. And we started digging around and realized that back in the 90s, we had contacted that person and, and told them to get that, you know, or we may have replaced it, I don't remember, but it, it's no longer there. So, you know, anecdotally, you just very rarely hear about a lead gooseneck. I've never heard anybody say there's an all lead service line, but you can't prove it. I mean, there are 40% that are unknown, but, you know. That- so you heard it right there from the engineer himself that there's about 40% of pipes in the system that are kind of unknown what they're actually made of. And one of the uh, stories, anecdotally, of one of the pipes of how old are they? Like, you know, like when somebody says, it's like, you want to know how old um, Missoula water pipes are? And people are like, how old are they? They're so old. There's some pipes that are still made of wood. And there was a pipe that was made of wood that was finally replaced um, probably about 10 years ago. But that, that, that pipe's been in there for like forever so there's there's a, a lot of infrastructure and piping is like one of those things because a lot of cities um and piping are all having to start to realize it's like it's time to replace pretty much every single pipe that's ever been put in in the existence of most cities and towns because it's all coming like all the times and all the things for the need for these pipes and the metal for these pipes are coming um at full swing again so um basically um by 1930 here's a little history lesson the city of missoula exploded with water mains and uh service lines and wells popping up with the ever-growing population that was in missoula um 1930s was a big year because the majority of the water before that came from the rattlesnake area uh where the primarily source of water for Missoula was. Of course, anyways, the point of this meeting is to set up a system that could spend money without dealing with going over budget, but there's still chances that they're going to have to raise the rates to keep up with that. 1% of their budget would go into replacing these water mains and hopefully sustain itself that will replace pipes um, every year for... 100 years, and then by 100 years, you'll start again. Kind of like what they do with the Golden Gate Bridge. Once they finish painting them, they'll be just painting again. All right, Dale Bickle, uh, city administrator and finance officer, talks about how, how it will affect the rate payers on a more specific level. Um, we don't put growth and development on, on the rate payers. It's done through uh, a development fee and in partnership with the you know, private sector. If we do, you know, we'll do uh, water main... Um, upsizing and those things and typically uh, uh, we will be bringing back at some point probably next fall a, a water development fee um, similar to the sewer development fee to have that that helps pay for these growth uh, related assets that aren't so they aren't borne by the um, regular rate payers now one thing you can all right see- so that was Dale Bickle kind of um, reassuring some of the citizens of Missoula that uh, any uh, money that's getting made from Missoula Water Company goes back into the water system and potentially with uh, a fund that would be able to pay for an expansion. But of course, when you're building a new infrastructure of water systems, it's going to cost money regardless. But it, does, it won't cost me to pay for um, a person who's on the other side of town to have a water system, that kind of deal. So it's kind of like if they build it there the people in that area will have to pay higher rates until a lot of that payment's already paid off. So that's kind of how they usually work the system. All right, so uh, that's pretty much it for uh, your public works. This is one of those projects that will work as soon as the money becomes available, not the other way around. If they don't have the money, they um, they won't raise and adjust finances to follow through with a lot of these actions with that 1% of their uh, funding going into the water uh, service line replacements. So that kind of concludes your public works. You can watch the whole meeting online as well from the city of Missoula's website. Moving on, we got land use and planning. Let's talk about that for a little while. I'm looking at the clock and I still have enough time. There's a lot of talk in terms of buildings, um, a 10 unit complex in the Hillview Crossing in accordance with the city zoning ordinance, Title 20. There's a lot of things. The thing is, the city wants to add more to um, this, and Jason uh, Reiston talks about inserting this into uh, the Hillview Crossing. It's kind of like a townhouse exemption crossing, all sorts of things. Um, did I delete him? I totally deleted his quote. Darn it. All right, let's, let's find it again. This is, this is not good. Not good at all. Just bear with me. I got it. It's coming up. It's coming. Here it comes. Um, you gotta find that. Okay. So here it is. Um, Jason Reiston. The property management companies both help us set the budgets 
and have the list of everything that needs to be included that, in that budget. In a case like this, we're going to have um, everything from snow plowing to road maintenance to the stormwater maintenance and the like that are going to be included in those. And so you're going to have a budget both for the annual maintenance of those, you're going to have a budget for replacement costs, for capital replacement costs for each of those. Those are built in. Uh, we advise all of our developers and clients to create those from, at the start so that when you're buying in, you know what the association fees are going to be. And then when we get to that turnover date, we have those funds in place so the developer is upholding its fiduciary duties to the homeowners association to turn it over in good standing. All right. So what is basically all about this meeting is ba um, building a public right-of-way um, unit complex on a private um, area. So they're trying to make sure that everyone's on the up and up. Everyone's telling everyone the right amount of information. Um, anybody who's going to be moving into these new uh, uh, property areas will, won't be um, high, um you know, won't know what's going in. So basically, they're kind of like building a small little a villa town type deal. Um, and they're working on the system of how they're going to pay for certain things and everything going forward about this. This project is supposed to mirror a lot of other projects in town in terms of those budgets and bylaws to place to make HOAs possible and actively run these programs with some oversight. Uh, most of these developments have to have a property a management in terms of this. So, um, Brian Van Losberg is talking a little bit more about development. So here he is. What feels different uh, about this a bit, and, and certainly we've heard this from constituents, is um, the hillside that this is happening on. Sure. And, um, you know, a, a number of these developments that have come in, um, it, it appears um, that if something goes amiss with the functioning of it, the issues associated with, say, an HOA that's not, you know, even if it's handed over in sort of a healthy form, uh, but it you know, takes due diligence to keep it going in a healthy way, that the effects of that would be largely contained to the development itself. And here you've got this surrounding community downslope, so to speak, uh, particularly relative to stormwater concerns or the geotechnical nature where it doesn't feel that way. It feels like this goes if if this goes defunct or if the HOA you know doesn't act properly, doesn't act prudently and responsibly relative to just say the stormwater facilities, that those effects will affect a larger swath of people. So. All right. So Brian von Lochberg is concerned about inserting a whole nother uh, unit complex in the middle of a developed neighborhood. A lot of things that are happening in terms of development in the city of Missoula and. Um, Jason um, Wrightston, um, he talks about some of the challenges that uh, he, as a developer, faces. The city of Missoula doesn't really have any flat, easy ground left to develop. We developed it all. Um, we don't have a new Costco because we don't, can't find a parcel to build a new Costco on. So what you're left with are parcels that are all going to have some amount of challenge with them, right? And so how do we deal with the challenge? You have adopted regulations to deal with those challenges. And staff's conditions of approval have addressed a number of those challenges. So you zoned this property, RT10, uh, which created a certain minimum density. You then adopted, well, not then. I mean, it's not sequential. But you also adopted hillside standards. And the hillside standards take into consideration the slope and the geotechnical side of things. And... All right, so um, they already have a lot of development in, on um, the hillside, um, so they're just going to figure out what works for them already and what uh, what doesn't and trying to insert that in the new development. So th this is a very interesting to just kind of really talk about because one of the bigger things that are happening in the city of Missoula is gentrification. There's a lot of big unit complex buildings getting built into smaller areas. Orchard Homes was another big one that just happened recently, which was got approved by the city council where they put in townhouses and high-density living arrangements there as well. Um, there's a lot of things already uh, into development, but there's a lot of checks and balances that require oversight by the city of Missoula. Jim Newsom talks about private roads with public interest um, into making that a public road. So this is what Jim Newsom had to say, uh, what's happened in the past and what Missoula has had to deal with when it comes to encroaching on private lands. This was litigated, as, as you all well know, this was litigated and the Human Resource Council lost the lawsuit uh, trying to get the road established by Hillview Crossing. So um, 
I, I would caution you gravely about trying to do anything on your own because I think it could be an inverse condemnation. And, and the reason why this... <laughs> All right, so um, like Jim Nugent said, this um, could be... Uh, a way this could be a, a bad sign because it can open the door for uh, a, a lawsuit that the city of Missoula would lose because they already lost this lawsuit before when the city of Missoula tried to acquire private land for public right-of-way type deal. Basically, this whole meeting was a back and forth of making sure all details are open and plausible for development standards for the city of Missoula and within the neighborhood of the Hillview Crossing. The private citizens would have to voice any concerns that they have with an understanding that the city doesn't encroach on private right-of-way. Of course, this this item will continue in land use and planning. This is something that's going to be ongoing. Um, this is a development site as well. And like he said, there's not many places to develop in the city of Missoula except for up the hill. I mean, there's a lot of places that still need a lot of development. One of the bigger things that are happening in the city of Missoula, just kind of throwing back to this and there, is Northside. Northside has a lot of land that's they're developing up there as well. A lot of land's already uh, in um, basically pre-development phase where they're trying to figure out the area because there's a lot of mixed industrial commercial land on the north side. So this um, that's an example of kind of like what they're doing right now is like a big plan to figure out uh, how to make Hillview because a lot of those places up there are are sit within the city, but at the same time are still somewhat on the outskirts where they can still be quasi considered uh, county land. And like you said, there's not many flat areas in the city of Missoula, um, but there are always plenty of flat land in the county. But a lot of uh, county property won't subdivide a lot of the property for development. All right, so. That's kind of what's happening within the city. If you are interested in finding out more information about the city of Missoula, you can go on the website, do your own research, and find out more information because these meetings are really long, and there was some public comment in that meeting as well, and you can watch those and more by going on to ci.missoula.mt.us. So nice. Such a great website. I just love using it. But if you want clean audio, you can always go to MCAT.org. MCAT.org is your resource for everything MCAT. I want to give another shout out to our Spring Flicks. Spring Flicks is a uh, week-long, five days of fun and filmmaking. It's $150 for each kid, which is basically pretty cheap if you really think about it. $150 for a whole week, nine to f uh, three in the afternoon. It's basically it kind of takes place, replaces uh, school for that week. Um, and it's just a fun little place to hang out here at MCAT for a lot of those uh, misfit kids who just uh, just like making movies. Boom. That's kind of what it's all about. All right. So um, I also want to say that MCAT will be live streaming tonight. We do high school sports. Um, if you like us on MCAT's Facebook page, Missoula's Community Media Resource, look for the uh, MCAT trying to get out of the M on the logo, um, and you'll be able to find um, or if you don't want to find it, you can like us on our Facebook page and you'll get notified when we are live, which will be live at 4.30 this afternoon. Um, if you're watching the, this afternoon, you still have about two hours until the live stream of, from Hellgate versus Genesis Prep out of Idaho. Um, Genesis Prep is a, a, a one of those um, private schools that plays uh, Hellgate on an annual basis, and they're going to be playing um, today at 4.30, both boys and girls. So 4.30 and 6 p.m., we're going to be live streaming them both back-to-back. -back. You can check all that out and more. And if you missed it, it'll be on our Facebook page for replay. All right, so um, it is. we have about five minutes left in the show. I just want to give a brief overview of some of the events that are happening in the city of Missoula. Um, tonight, um, my boy Jack Catmull and his band Carpool will be playing at Free Cycles with the Scurfs. Um, they're going to be opening for the Scurfs, and Free Cycles is doing a kind of like dress up. Um, it's a winter ball formal dance. This time, local rockers Carpool. Formal dress is encouraged. Photo booth and prizes for best dress and best dance. Uh, best dance. Um, I'm sorry, the grammar is kind of throwing me off, but uh, $5 suggested donation to enter. So it's going to be happening tonight at 7 p.m. But of course, throwing it back, you got the Mo University Planetarium. Um, they're doing a moving through time and space. The University of Montana is doing a... Um, Basically a planetarium show, and you can check that out by going on to the University of Montana's website, umt.edu. Um, what other things are happening this morning? As per usual, you got all those um, tiny tales and story time of the Missoula Public Library starting at 10.30 a.m. You got uh, Children's Museum mobile exhibit. Uh, their, uh, Children's Museum had to close down a couple years ago because of those dang cigar smokers and their lease and their... Uh, 
darn, they couldn't get out of their lease or something like that. But there's, uh, yeah, of course, but they're doing an um, exhibit where they're bringing their uh, museum to you. So they're going to be doing it during story, story time at the library, and they're enthusiastically planning a new home in the Bizzle Public Libraries. Um, their team has been working to creative ways to they can stay connected with families they love to serve, and they're rolling out their new free program, Community Connections, to bring the museum experience to you. So that's what's kind of what's happening there. And also, I want to uh, give a shout out to MCT. They're doing Calendar Girls for the last weekend. I've heard nothing but good things about it. I, I never got a chance to see it quite yet, but I might go see it this weekend, Calendar Girls is basically about retired old women who uh, basically take pictures for a calendar and it's a raunchy comedy so it's PG-13 if you uh, wanted to rate it in the movie standards so it's a it's a it's it's a it's a play. It's going to be playing uh, nightly at 7.30 p.m. with a matinee on Saturday and Sunday at 2 p.m. You can check all that out by going to mctinc.org. All right. Um... Yeah, that's pretty much it. I, I also want to mention that we do our Saturday drop-ins. Our Saturday drop-ins are every single Saturday from 1 to 5 p.m. We won't be doing it um, in February, uh, not all February, but one um, date in February, which we will not be doing a Saturday drop-in specifically as the Big Sky Documentary Film Festival gets into full gear starting February 16th, I want to say, um, but it's going to go on um, throughout the whole entire week. So. Just be aware of that. Um, I'll, I'll remind you again about that uh, as we get into it. Um, they're doing a, a try scuba diving at the YMCA. So if you're interested in learning about scuba diving, they have the equipment there. And these are 30-minute introductory classes. Um, and if you are a kid, this is for kids. And you have to be – there's, there's a lot of things that are required uh, about this so you have to be able to uh, st be able to stand in four feet um, water to be able to do scuba diving, and you have to be able to swim a lot by yourself. So if you're going to be scuba diving, you're basically just strapping on heavy material to make you sink underwater. So you have to know how to swim in case something happens. So scuba diving teaches you guys about scuba diving 1 p.m. in the afternoon starting tomorrow. All right, so I have about two minutes left in the show, and I'm going to spend it playing you some beautiful music from Garage Band. As you can see, it's pretty busy. So um, for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramph, and here's this music. I made it pretty simple, so don't worry about it. Besides that looping thing. 